Canadian federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh pictured here sharing his opinions through the unspoken language of dance. It's the universal language. Is sharing his take on the foreign interference report. And it is very different from what we heard from Elizabeth May after reading the same report earlier this week. It is getting harder and harder to make sense of what's going on here. Because Singh says that he read the report and he's more alarmed than ever. He talked about how some MPs were willing participants in foreign states interfering in Canadian politics. And he said, quote, I am more alarmed today than I was yesterday after having read the report. Which is completely different than what Green Party leader Elizabeth May took away from this report earlier this week, where she said she was relieved after reading it. And she said that she's, quote, very comfortable sitting with her colleagues. But Singh very specifically pointed his criticism at the Conservative Party. And it would probably help if there was, I don't know, like another party leader who could read the document. But Pierre Poilievre refuses to get his security clearance. Like, Poilievre just doesn't want to read it. Doesn't want to know who in his party was interfered with by foreign governments. Because he'd rather just be able to make stuff up, as his surrogate Michael Chong shared. One quick question. Where is Poilievre? Anybody notice that he's been very suspiciously absent from the public eye lately? Ever since the controversy around this report began. And it's weird, because he's normally in front of the camera constantly, but lately, he's been, like, sending out representatives. Almost as if he doesn't want to draw attention to himself as he refuses his security briefing. Almost. Like, this is incredibly concerning. Because either Singh or May isn't telling the whole story. And without seeing the whole report, it's impossible to know who. So again, liberals, release the report. Or at the very least, stand with your fellow parliamentarians and demand that the NSICOP release it. Stop hiding behind bureaucracy. Stop claiming your hands are tied. They aren't. I want to take a second to highlight the Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce, because they just launched their provincial election platform, and it is wild. Because one of the things that they have decided to push for in the coming Saskatchewan election, on behalf of the entire Saskatchewan business community, is child labor. Just straight up child labor. They want to, quote, find a balance between protecting youth and encouraging early labor force engagement. The chamber recommends lowering the age that youth are able to work to 13 years of age or above. They want children to be able to work. Like, this is child labor. They are 13 years old. But it appears that the Sask Chamber of Commerce believes that the children yearn for the mines. Worth noting, just a few months ago, a 14-year-old was poisoned in their workplace and nearly died. Saskatchewan does not keep workers safe. And in particular, they are not keeping young workers safe. But they want to throw 13-year-olds into the mix. Like, what is even happening in Saskatchewan anymore? Have we just abandoned caring about humanity at all? Just sacrifice everything to the economy like it's some sort of volcano god? Like, where does it end? Where is the limit? How much are we willing to be exploited before people finally step up and say enough is enough? Because the Chamber of Commerce is trying to bring back child labor. That's where we're at. Alberta Premier Danielle Smith pictured here after telling an incredibly offensive joke at a Premier's meeting. She told a harrowing version of the aristocrats. It took nearly 10 minutes. Anyways, she continues to privatize Alberta health care. This time, it's a continued expansion of the private home care system. Can't imagine anyways that ends badly. So this is an expansion of an existing project that began in Edmonton in the spring of 2022. Basically, instead of receiving home care through the government, you get a voucher. You can either pay for or subsidize your own home care from a business that you choose. Essentially, sending public funds to private businesses as is the Danielle Smith way. And if you want to get a sense of just how well this is going to be run, patients are responsible for monitoring the quality of care under the client-directed model. So who's accountable for your care? You are. Awesome. Because everybody knows private citizens are the best equipped to manage healthcare businesses. Like, there's basically no oversight of this program. Like, getting more people cared for in their homes is a good thing. Do not misunderstand me here but a program that funnels public funds to private businesses with no accountability oversight is a problem. Like Danielle Smith said that the government may impose an accreditation system. That's it. They just might. They won't. Don't get me wrong. They just might. And so they're hoping to fill out this program with healthcare aides that make between $22 and $26 an hour. But they'll be paying those private businesses about $33 an hour. And the businesses will be pocketing the difference, because of course they will. So profit for private businesses unmonitored care for the public, who wins? Who is this for? Who benefits? The answer is, as always, private healthcare industries. They get more cash and the AHS gets to wash their hands of them. It's the Danielle Smith way.
Canada's youth face an enormous number of challenges, but one of the biggest is that they are growing up in a society that doesn't seem to want them there. We've created a society where kids do not seem to be particularly welcome. They're not really welcome to hang out in public spaces without being shuffled along. Like, especially for teenagers, their presence is viewed as a problem in many cases. And it's only getting worse. And to give you a sense of just how bad things are, I want to highlight a new policy from Les Cedres in Quebec, where they've rolled out a bylaw that requires kids to collect signatures in order to play in the streets. They need two-thirds of households on the street that they want to play on in order to be able to play on the street. So if you want to go out and play basketball in front of your house, you should probably file the appropriate paperwork. Because if it's not a free play zone, can you even play freely? Like, this is absolutely ridiculous. And like, a lot of this is being brought forward just out of concerns around traffic. So the question you have to ask is, why are the kids being asked to behave differently and not the cars? Like, couldn't you just lower the speed limits? But no, kids need to apply to play. But of course, a representative from the town said, don't worry, quote, we won't give tickets to kids playing hockey in the street. At worst, we'll give them a warning. Oh, well, thank goodness, just a warning. A warning of what? If they don't move, what will happen? What are you warning them about? Hmm? But I love this. We have a certain level of tolerance because the road is used by everyone. Yeah, that's how street hockey works. You yell, car, and everybody moves. Like, why when it comes to sharing the streets between cars and children are we expecting the children to be the responsible ones? Like, they're just putting an end to street hockey, functionally. And it's entirely just for the benefit of cars, so they can drive faster without being concerned about hitting those pesky children. Good for them, I guess. Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe pictured here on a hiking trip with very confusing temperatures. It appears to be quite cold, but only from the waist up. Anyways, he continues to step on political rakes at every opportunity. This time, it's patting himself on the back for Saskatchewan's graduate retention program. You see, in Saskatchewan, when you graduate, you get $20,000 in tax credits to start your career. If you stay in Saskatchewan, they have to bribe you to stay. And he wants you to know that under the NDP, there was no graduate retention program. Ooh, bad. So, a couple of things. So, first off, since 2007, tuition in Saskatchewan has risen by 93%. Such savings. But also, the fact that he's saying, we've got the graduate retention tax credit and the NDP don't. Brr. The NDP created the tax credit. It was one of the last things they did in office. They announced it in 2004, and it was a part of the NDP's final budget before they lost to the Saskatchewan party. He's literally taking credit for an NDP policy by saying the NDP never had one. Except for, you know, the way that they created it. That does throw a wrench in this little narrative. It's also worth noting that the Saskatchewan government significantly reduced the program. It started out as a tax refund over seven years. They changed it to a non-refundable tax credit over ten. They cut their spending on it by about $30 million a year. So he's patting himself on the back for a program that he didn't create... And made cuts to. Why? So this person says it's very difficult to get around in Saskatchewan without a car. And they're right. But I want to highlight something important. That's a choice. That is by design. It doesn't have to be that way. And we need to stop acting like it always has to be that way. Like Saskatchewan had the Saskatchewan Transportation Corporation. We had a public bus service. It ran intercity buses all the time. It was a public service run by the Saskatchewan government. And the SAS party got rid of it. Just to save a buck. Making it impossible to get anywhere without a car. The cities refused to invest in transit. Regina just used a bunch of federal transit funds to build a pool. Which is a great way to get to work, obviously. These are choices. Building a car-centric society is by design. Probably a total coincidence that in many municipal elections, the primary political donors are folks like auto dealers. It's all about cars, man, because cars make money. Cars are profitable. Public transit? That just benefits the public. Can't have that. Gotta make them pay. Can we please stop blaming teachers for their working conditions? This person's saying that if the schools don't expel violent bullies, don't come crying about working conditions. Okay, do you think that teachers get to decide whether or not a kid gets expelled? We don't get to decide whether or not that kid has a right to an education. And what level of bad behavior in schools is enough to overrule that kid's right to an education? Just out of curiosity. Like, where's the threshold where that kid no longer gets educated? Like, the rights of the victim don't automatically supersede the rights of the offender. They both have rights. Like, genuine question. What does expulsion actually solve? 
Does it solve anything, or does it just make it somebody else's problem? That's the second. We need supportive programs. We need counselors. We need funding. We need reduced student-teacher ratios. If your plan for education basically boils down to just kick out the bad kids, your plan is bad. Because every kid deserves an education, regardless of what you think of them. Regardless of their behavior. They still have rights. One of the more frustrating things about posting on TikTok is that the trolls have, like, four jokes. There's the my pronouns are blah, blah, blah joke. The I identify as an attack helicopter. Something about Justin Trudeau and blackface. And this one, get out of your mom's basement. Couple of things. First off, I'm in my own basement. It's lovely, I got like a little office down here. In the home that I own with my lovely wife. But also, what if I did live with my parents? What's the problem with that? It's a housing crisis, dude. Who are you to judge somebody else's living circumstances in the middle of a housing crisis? But more than that, what if I was taking care of my parents? Like, multi-generational living is incredibly common in Canada. What's your hang-up with living with your parents? Why do you feel open to judging other people's living situations on your phone? What do you care if I live in my mom's basement? Do people who live with their parents not deserve respect, decency? Seems like this is more of a you problem than a me problem. Why don't you share some photos of your palatial home? We'll wait. This person wants us to know that they have a full head of hair, they just shave it because they're far right and hate commies. Interesting. What about being far right requires you to shave your head? Can you be a little more specific? Like, which specific far right uh, beliefs cause you to shave your head? What you doing hanging out in my comment section? Telling on yourself. Like, this is where we're at. There are people who are just straight up declaring that they're fascists in my comment section. Like, I shave my head and I'm part of the far right is a pretty clear message about what kind of person this is. And yikes. Really telling on yourself here, dude. With your full name. And photo. Bold. Let's see how that plays out. Come on, dude. I posted a video talking about how it's difficult to get around in Saskatchewan without a car and that that's a policy choice. That we got rid of a public busing agency and that the cities don't invest in transit. And this person jumped in and said, maybe you should drive to every farm in Saskatchewan for free and drive the to town every day. No. Why are you even saying this? Like, what do you think you're doing here? I shared that the lack of public transportation in Saskatchewan is a policy choice. And your response was to get personally angry at me. It wasn't my policy choice. I'm just telling you that it exists. But also, if somebody advocates for things to be better in our society, and your solution is to demand personal moral perfection from them, rather than address the points they're making, you got nothing. You're just trying to exclude the person from the conversation because you can't disagree with them in any meaningful way. All you've got is vibes. So you try to say, well, what he says doesn't count. Sure it does. Hi. One of the worst parts about being a teacher is that some members of the public just straight up feel like they own you. That you are in no way entitled to have a life of your own. Period. Like this person is very upset that I play video games. How dare I? And I do play video games. So what? I stream them on Twitch, twitch.tv slash steve underscore boots. But every time that I stream on Twitch, my followers start a timer to see how long it takes before somebody complains that a teacher has the temerity to play video games in the evening. Last night, we set a new record. It took eight minutes. We've never made it past 30. And I get dozens of people complaining that I have free time, upset that I have the time to play video games at 7 p.m. on a Thursday, as if I should somehow be teaching at that time. Like, we're even on a work to rule right now. I couldn't if I wanted to, but I also don't want to. It's 7 p.m. on a Thursday. I have a life, but they don't want teachers to have a life. They want us to be drones that live in the classroom and live only to be abused by the public. No, we're people. Make your peace with it. This person's claiming that people hate leftists because we can't be trusted at all. We're liars and cheaters and hateful. We don't have one redeeming quality. Are you sure about that? Because ever since I became a leftist, I've developed a couple of new redeeming qualities. For example, a belief in the fundamental humanity of others. 
an ideology rooted in compassion. And best of all, laser vision! You see, the vision for the future on the left also comes with lasers. So join us for a bold vision for the future. Laser vision! Ah!